I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm talking about does creatine help your brain? So as usual, I'll start with the take-home message, and that is in the last few years, there's been a tremendous surge in internet claims that creatine will help not only your muscles, but your brain, and sales of creatine have jumped up dramatically. And while there is extensive research and human experience showing that creatine in conjunction with exercise does help build muscle mass and strength. The evidence that it helps with mental and cognitive capabilities is extremely weak, extremely contradictory. And at this point in time, it would not be fair to say we have any evidence that it's helping with ADHD or clearly with other mental health conditions. Now, that doesn't mean future research may not reveal a role for it in mental health or cognitive health, but it's not there yet as of September of 2025. I'll start with what is creatine? So if you see a video where they are talking about creatine being a protein, run screaming in the other direction. Creatine is not a protein. Now, it's not that distantly related. So proteins are a series of amino acids linked together and special bonds called peptide bonds. And the smallest protein consists of at least 20 amino acids. Creatine is just combining the amino acid arginine with glycine, linking those together in a bond that is not a peptide bond, and then adding another, a methyl group, originally from methionine, a third amino acid, but specifically from acidenosyl L-methionine, which is SAMe, that same substance that's used for treating depression. So Again, it's a much smaller molecule. That means consuming it in your diet is not as likely as a large protein to be broken down and degraded. So in most humans, about half their creatine supply comes from diet and about half comes from being manufactured by this process in your liver, kidneys, and pancreas. And when I say you get creatine from food, virtually every meat source is a good source of creatine. Vegans and some other people with restricted diets may be getting substantially less creatine. So that's why the half from diet, half your body makes is very rough approximations. It comes from the Greek word for flesh. So again, that's, it was found and discovered first in animal proteins, animal muscles. And it is very different origin than the word, Latin word that means to bring forth or produce, where we get the word create, create, creative, and creature. After creatine, is made in the liver, kidney, or pancreas, or absorbed from the digestive system. It's in your circulatory system, in your blood, and there are active transporters that move it into muscle cells and nerve cells. Once it's in the muscle cells or nerve cells, it's phosphorylated, so a phosphoryl group is added on to make phosphocreatine, and it's actually phosphocreatine, not creatine itself, that's the primary storage molecule in the muscles or in the brain, subject to action by an enzyme called creatine kinase, or CK, converts phosphocreatine back into creatine. And when it does that, it releases or creates, causes formation of an ATP molecule. And ATP is the energy molecule that's used for cells, in cells throughout the whole body. And particularly cells that are metabolically very active, like muscle and nerve cells, require lots of ATP. And that's why they benefit from having storage, energy storage systems in site at their location. Now, creatine is not to be confused with creatinine. So creatinine is a breakdown product of creatine. And if you've had blood tests where they ordered what's called a metabolic panel or a chemical panel, you've probably seen creatinine being recorded because it is one of the very simple, basic measures and particularly creatinine is a marker of kidney function because of how it's filtered by the glomerulus part of the kidney. When they calculate a GFR or glomerular filtration rate to measure kidney function, the variable that that's relying on is creatinine. Now, taking large amounts of creatine in your diet can lead to misleading creatinine levels in your blood and body. So that's one important thing to be aware of. And you might also have heard of creatinine kinase because it used to be a primary 
the primary way to detect from blood samples whether someone had a heart attack. So there's different forms of creatine kinase used in skeletal muscles, muscle throughout your body versus cardiac muscle in your heart. Releases of large amounts of MD form of creatinine kinase in the heart was a signal that you would likely had a heart attack. There are more specific markers that are being used now. Creatine was discovered in the muscles of animals more than 100 years ago. It wasn't too many years after they discovered it that they found that feeding those animals, including humans, extra creatine did increase the stores of phosphocreatine within muscles and to a lesser extent in nerves. So again, the nerves are not as adept at taking it up. This was known for years and there were sort of experimentation seeing what it did to muscles' ability to perform. But it wasn't until the 1992 Barcelona Olympics where Linford Christie, who won the 100-meter sprint for, the, for Britain, publicly talked about using boosting with creatine, as did a few other British track stars. Within four years, by the time of the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, the claim is more than 80% of competitors were using creatine to boost muscle strength and or endurance. So creatine is considered a natural substance. It is not a banned substance. It is allowed by doping agencies. And there have been extensive rodent and human data that in conjunction with vigorous exercise, taking creatine from an external source does build muscle size or volume and does build muscle strength. There are some exceptions to that. So in horses, the studies indicate that feeding them extra creatine does not lead to increased muscle stores or creatine or phosphocreatine or change any strength or performance measures. And why that's worth bringing up is that this is a very simple, basic, important metabolic process, but results in one species can't necessarily be translated to another. So when I'll jump ahead in a little bit and talk about cognitive or um, neural functioning improvements in animals, that doesn't necessarily tell us what is happening in humans. A typical loading dose for creatine is to take 20 grams a day for five days and then to continue with five grams a day indefinitely. So way bigger dose than you're getting from most other supplements, which are measured in milligrams, which are a thousandth of a gram or micrograms, so something like Synthroid for thyroid problems is measured in micrograms, which are millionths of a gram. So when we're taking creatine as a supplement, it's a fairly substantial dose compared to many other supplements or medications. Most people can tolerate that large dose of creatine. Again, we're getting a normal some amount of it in our diet anyway. Some people do have nausea as a side effect. Moderately common, there is some, a few pounds of weight gain, and some of that seems to be muscle mass, and some of that seems to be water gain. As more creatine is stored in the muscle, there's water is pulled into the muscle as well. So you need to remain hydrated when you're taking this. Creatinine, the breakdown product of creatine, can be boosted by taking extra creatine. That does not mean that your kidneys are failing, but it can make it harder to interpret kidney reports. In the few decades after this became popular among weightlifters and bodybuilders, there were several reports of kidney problems among people taking loading doses in the range of 20 grams a day of creatine. Renologists, or people who study kidneys, have re-examined many of these case reports or all the case reports they could find and were available, they could come up with other explanations other than that the creatine was responsible. So many people who were in these case reports had pre-existing health problems. Almost all of them were engaged in really excessive exercise regimens. And we know that rhabdomyolysis, which is breakdown of muscle proteins and releasing of the blood to a dangerous level, is a not rare outcome from really excessive bouts of exercise. And particularly kidneys are the organ that are most likely to be damaged by rhabdomyolysis. So the kidney experts consider that if you are healthy to begin with and you're staying hydrated, that creatine in the commonly used dosages is likely to be 
extremely likely to be safe and benign, and that maybe some individuals with pre-existing health issues or kidney damage should be monitored more carefully and be more careful about this confounding thing there is that kidney damage is often silent until it presents very far along. So I had a friend in my running club who was in his late 20s. He looked completely healthy. He would run with us weekly. And then on routine laboratory tests, it was found he was in end-stage kidney failure. It turned out that there were genetic reasons and he wound up needing a kidney transplant from his brother. Kidney damage itself can be sometimes hard to detect until it's very far along. But what about creatine for the brain? Again, that's what many people are promoting it for these days. And there's fairly good evidence that in humans and in many other animals that if you increase the amount of creatine in the diet or as supplements, there is some increased level of creatine or phosphocreatine in stored in neurons. It's not nearly proportionally as big an increase as we see in muscles. And again, there is active transport that's required to get it into muscles. It seems to be a less efficient process. And whether it's primarily on neurons versus astrocytes is not as effectively put into the brain, but there are measurable increases can be found. 1990s, there were some anecdotal case reports of creatine being used in a range of neurologic conditions. What I'm going to get into looking at some of that data in a very cursory form, I am indebted to a researcher. I never met him, but he writes extensively. His name is Igor Eckert. He's a Brazilian. He's not associated right now with any university or elsewhere. A careful statistician and has pointed out flaws in many studies that have been produced. So Parkinson's and Huntington's are both muscle wasting disease. So we call them neuromuscular conditions, but it's very clear in both of them that the pathology or damage is to the neurons and it's secondarily muscles that are controlled by those neurons wither away or become spasmodic and contract in aberrant ways. So a consortium of several different universities several years ago, almost a decade ago, in a large methodologically rigorous study. They gathered more than a thousand or almost a thousand patients who were planning to gather more than that. They had five years of data and they actually stopped the trial because of futility. And the futility, the official terminology is that the evidence was so robustly showing that there was no benefit to taking creatine in terms of functional ability, in terms of muscle wasting, in Parkinsonism, that it was considered unethical to consider, unethical to continue the study. Seven, eight years ago, a study in Huntington's, and Huntington's is a much rarer condition, but they had gathered more than 500 different patients, again, several different universities, they had several years of data, and they stopped the study again for, quote, futility, that creatine was not showing any improvement compared to the placebo group. It was considered unethical to keep going with that study. So the biggest studies we have on Parkinson's and Huntington's or any neurologic condition indicate no benefit from taking creatine. A few years ago, there's a 2022 meta-analysis published and it claimed there was evidence that creatine helped with human memory and other cognitive executive function abilities. And Eckert wrote a letter to the editor for that journal pointing out that in this meta-analysis, they did repeated measures from the same patients, meaning many of the patients had multiple studies, but they were treating them for analysis as if these were the same patient with multiple test results, but they believe were different individuals. And the authors retracted their findings. And the final conclusion with the proper analysis was that any differences between the creatine and the placebo groups were insignificant, that there was not a group effect on memory, cognition, other brain functions. There was a little evidence that maybe in older individuals or some other subsets, maybe creatine was having an effect. So a more recent study, a 2024 meta-analysis, combed through hundreds of studies. They only found 16 that were done as randomized, controlled, vigorous, rigorously done studies less than 500 subjects, so that's averaging only about 30 subjects a study. That's a pretty small sample size, 
And their conclusions in this meta-analysis was creatine. And these were looking at a variety of mental health conditions and people in stress environments or other conditions, sleep deprivation of others. There was no overall impact on cognitive function, that there was no overall impact on executive function. There was no overall impact on attention. Now there was a small decrease in the time needed to perform attention tasks. There was a measurably positive impact on memory. Creatine across the studies did seem helpful there. There was no overall impact on processing speed. And that the improvements that they did find were only in narrow groups of patients, not in healthy, normal individuals. So again, that doesn't disprove creatine might not have more benefits, but the studies have been so inconsistent both within a study and between studies in terms of proving any of evidence. Now, some have claimed we should be able to see more of a benefit in executive function tests rather than very simple tests of attention, memory, perception, because executive function circuitry is more complex and more energy dependent. There's one sleep deprivation study where the acute effects of sleep deprivation could at least be ameliorated, improved, taking creatine the next day. Not a particularly large study, not one that's been replicated yet. Again, that's not disproving it. It's just saying we need more evidence. There's some evidence that in the elderly, maybe with Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment, there might be signs of some evidence. There's at least enough there that it's worth repeating and enlarging and doing more rigorous experiments. So far, there's not a single study looking at ADHD. I mean, if you go on Reddit or online and other forum, there's some people who swear that creatine helped with their ADHD. There's also numbers of people who felt that it didn't do anything. And there's small numbers of individuals who felt harmed their, or worse than their ADHD. Now, one interesting possibility I haven't seen anyone else writing about, I'm sure someone else has thought about it, that for the muscle benefits, you have to be doing fairly rigorous exercise, exercising those muscles. So it's possible that creatine is going to be most beneficial when you combine it with some mental exercise. It's also possible with more thorough studies, we will find bigger impact in more areas. Or it's possible that we will see, like with the Huntington's and Parkinson's studies, there's just not much there for the brain because neurons are a different organ than muscles and work differently. The good thing is, again, that creatine seems to be fairly safe. So there's much less barrier to trying it on your own if you would like to. Right now, the evidence is pretty darn weak that it's going to boost your brain function.